Well, good afternoon. So good to see all of you. Uh, I think I was in this room two years ago, and I probably was telling you a little bit about my wife. And uh, several have asked. I said she passed away a year ago, October 2nd. And uh, I wrote a little book about it. Uh, we were about uh, three years into a long slide down for seven years of dementia. And uh, one day I just picked up a pen, and, and I just almost felt compelled to write. And I've never written in real time before like that, but that's actually what kind of happened. Uh, I'd get a phone call from the nurse and said, your wife wants to talk to you. She feels alone. But she's standing right by the nurse. And I was just writing about that, and it was an amazing thing. But I want to tell you something, folks. I, uh, I look back at that seven years. I did probably some of the best writing of my life. But God just took me off the road. And, uh, and uh, there was three years where she was at skilled nursing. I never missed a meal for three years. And I was the only one in seven years that ever gave her a shower. She wouldn't let anybody else. And, uh, but the, the sense of God's presence during that time just kind of came over me. To this day, I've never felt the presence of God more than I did during that time. And the little book talks about what my presence means to her, but what God's presence meant to me. I share that because it has a lot to do with what we're talking about in terms of fear. Uh, the fear of abandonment or being alone is profound. Uh, we have this letter sent to our office some time ago. Let me just start the book with this. It said, I'm 36 years old. For as long as I can remember, I have been plagued with fears and anxieties. I was raised in an abusive family and lived under the threat of even worse treatment if I ever told. In the bondage of fear, I decided never to tell anyone. I came home one evening and found everyone gone. I was gripped with fear and crawled under my bed. Why weren't they home? Did they think I told someone? What would happen when they came back? I could never enjoy the simple little things that accompany childhood. My anxieties and fears followed me wherever I went. I was too afraid to try out for anything where I could possibly fail. I dreaded every exam. My stomach would turn up in knots from anxiety. I became a perfectionist who had to achieve whatever the cost. This pattern of fear continued into my teenage years and young adult life. I tried to accept Jesus twice but I feared not being good enough. I feared the rejection and ridicule of others, so I tried to keep everyone happy. Even sleep offered no reprieve. The nightmares I suffered as a result of the abuse of my childhood continued into my adult years. I'm a parent now, and I fear for my children. I'm an adequate mother. Will my children be hurt or abducted? I know this is robbing me of the life I want to live, but I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm living two lives. On the outside, I appear to be a very successful teacher, wife, mother, contributing member of society. But if people could see the con condition of my soul, they would notice only pain, anxiety, and fear. Can somebody help me? Can I help myself? Is this what life is supposed to be? No, it's not what life was supposed to be. And it wasn't from the beginning. Folks, we're living in incredible times. <laughs> I was an aerospace engineer 50 years ago. We celebrated the whole Apollo space program this year, 50 years of celebration. That brings back incredible memories to me. We had the guidance system for the lunar lander at that time, and it was after that that I, I went into ministry. But we also had the Hubble telescope, and I'm sure you know some of the history of that. It went up in space and it would malfunction and actually fixed it in space. Uh, but now we have the privilege to look into space, and we're just struck with awe. I mean, when, when you look at the extravagance of creation, you can't even imagine it. It's just beyond our, our ability to do that, and, and the, how far that we can see into space, and you say, and God created that. And all of that came from non-preexisting matter. But behind all of that creation is the mind of the universe who has always been eternally existent. And in all the spans of the universe, lifeless, devoid of life, there may be other planets like Earth that have biological life, but it's all subject to the natural law of death. Everything biological will die. 
everything. And it has to have some means to propagate itself by sowing seeds or cohabiting or something. But then God did something absolutely unique in all of the expanse of the universe. He took a piece of clay and breathed into man the life of God. It, it, it's so concerning to me how we don't fully grasp the content of that. The life that he have is his life. He shared his life with a man. If he ate from the tree of life, he could have lived forever. If he ate from the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, on that day he would surely die. He ate and he died. He didn't die physically. He lived another 900 years. But he died spiritually. He was separated from God. And if you look at archaeology and all the digs that they have around the world, and they're finding all these ancient civilizations, and they all had an altar by which they would sacrifice animals. Somehow I knew that sacrifice would be required to somehow get to that life, that eternal life that escaped everybody. I call it the primordial fear. And uh, it takes some understanding to grasp this, but let me take a few minutes to do that. Think about what happened immediately afterwards. The first emotion expressed by Adam was, I am afraid. To this day, it is the number one mental health problem of the world, anxiety disorders. What was he afraid of? There was nothing in the Garden of Eden to be afraid of. He had no chemical imbalances or neurological conditions that would require medication. Couldn't blame mom or dad. What was he afraid of? The absence of life. And there has been a pursuit throughout human history of people to somehow grasp that. And you go to the pyramids of Egypt and they will put in the canoe in the, in the pyramids as he could sail into the celestial sea. It has dominated every early culture of human history of trying to find that life, that primordial fear. And let me tie it in strangely with something you wouldn't normally think about. Because the first Adam was born both physically and spiritually alive. Because of sin, he died spiritually. The last Adam was born physically and spiritually alive. And true orthodoxy says that Jesus was both man and God. I mean, all of that was settled, hopefully, in the ecumenical councils. But listen to a, a comment made by Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan in the fourth century. In taking upon himself a human form, he also took upon himself the affections of the soul. As God, he was not distressed, but as a human, he was capable of being distressed. It was not as God he died, but as man. It was human voice that he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As human, therefore, he speaks on the cross, bearing with him our terrors. For amid dangers, it is very human response to think ourselves abandoned. As human, therefore, he distressed, weeps, and is crucified. The Apostles' Creed said that Jesus descended into hell. Hell, if you're not aware of it in the Old Testament, Sheol or Hades in the Greek, is the same word used for death. Why? Because they're essentially the same. Hell is loneliness where no love can penetrate. What happened between the cross and the resurrection is that Jesus, in the excruciating pain, took the plunge into the abyss of total isolation and aloneness. It wasn't the destiny that he went. It was the separation from God. That's the primordial fear. That's what he abandoned at that time. And even to this day, the whole concept of death. Have you ever gone into a mortuary where you didn't know anybody and suddenly you find yourself in a room with the corpse of a person you don't know? How did you feel? A little uncomfortable? Maybe even a little afraid or eerie? There's nothing there to be afraid of. The guy's dead. <laughs> <clears throat> But it's a fear we can't easily dismiss. It's like walking through the woods at night alone. It's dark, and you just feel kind of fear come over you. And then all of a sudden, a person walks up and high, and suddenly the fear dissipates. Or somebody walks into that room where you were alone with the carps, and suddenly it's gone. It's hard to understand that thing, but abandonment issues are so focused into this concept that there is really nothing more frightening than to be absolutely isolated and alone. I remember when I was... A little child on the farm, uh, I was taking a nap, apparently. Mom and Dad 
didn't know it, had gone over to the neighbors. And, and so I got up, Mom, nobody there. Ran around the house, Mom, nobody there. Ran outside, nobody. And I could just kind of feel the fear. The, the tensions rise up, and all of a sudden I saw him turn into the lane. Done, over with, just like that. And uh, what's interesting about fear, this primordial fear that I'm talking about, really is all resolved in Christ. The eternal life that Adam had is what Jesus came to give us. We're all born dead in our trespasses and sin. We all learn to live our life independent of God. And then one day we're born again. And that life, he who has the son has the life. What Adam and Eve lost in the fall was life. That's what Jesus came to give us. That means our soul right now is in union with God. That's why in one sense, for every believer, we're never alone. Never. Your body's a temple of God. And uh, the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in your life. And, uh, and tragically, most of the world that I have traveled is laboring under a third of the gospel. We presented Jesus as Messiah who died for our sins, and if we will put our faith in him and we die, we'll go to heaven. That would give you the impression that eternal life is something you get when you die. That is not true. He who has the Son has the life. I said what he came to do was to walk to that cross and die for our sins, but to be resurrected that we would have new life. That's what you have, folks. Life. He who has the Son has the life. I'm the bread of life. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live. Even if he dies, you will live spiritually even if you die physically. That should be so embraced in everybody's mind that you would immediately respond. But that's only two-thirds of the gospel. When Adam sinned, God had given them dominion over the birds of the sky, the beasts, the field, the fish, the sea. But when they sinned, they lost that. And Satan became the rebel hold of authority and the God of this world. And what did Jesus come to do? To undo the works of Satan. Read it, 1 John 3, 8. And during this time, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. And uh, that's the gospel most of the world is waiting to hear. Because the dominant religious orientation of this world, any missiologist will tell you this, is spiritism. And they're leaving little baskets of fruit out to ward off the demons. They're contacting their shamans and their witch doctors. Even in America, you'd have to wait to the light, late night TV to see all the ads for the psychics that are going to give you guidance. Now I saw one last week at 8 o'clock at prime time. Call the California psychic. We'll guide your life. All kinds of testimonies come out. Folks, that's the world we're living in. He is the God of this world. That's what Jesus called him, and I believe that. And we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. All that enters into this. You can't give a complete answer and leave out the reality of the spiritual world. You can't. You don't have a complete answer. And so fear is the most prevalent emotion that we are experiencing in the world today. And it has been from the beginning. Most repeated commandment of Scripture, 400 times, fear not. Did that work? No. <laughs> well, you shouldn't be afraid. Didn't work, did it? So let's take a serious look at it. Anxiety disorders, by definition, includes panic attacks, anxiety, and depression. Let me just say a little bit, because in our book we cover all three, but I'm going to focus on fear here today. But anxiety is like fear without an adequate cause. People are anxious because they don't know. Therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow, etc. I discovered something about that, though, that I think is very, very critical to understand. It's only used about 25 times in scriptures, and five times it's in a positive sense. All emotions are a God-given thing. I mean, there are important feedbacks in our life and that are very real that we should never deny. We should just understand them. And, uh, but if you think of anxiety in the sense of care, if you've got an important exam tomorrow, you should feel a little anxious. Proper response? Study. You know? uh, your kid's two hours late. You should feel anxious, shouldn't you, if you care for your child? Proper response? Pray. <laughs> or call the police or whatever. But, um, and so it's not always negative. <clears throat> but the word itself, miramaneo, comes from two root words, nuas and marizo, means divided mind. And you can see that when Paul talks in Matthew about uh, the Sermon on the Mount. It says, no man can serve two masters. You'll either serve God or mammon, therefore don't be anxious about tomorrow. 
Take no thought for tomorrow, the King James said. They brought the right attitude out of that. In other words, you're a double-minded man. According to James, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So when you come to Ephesians 5, 6, 7, and 8, which you're familiar with, be anxious for nothing. What he's really saying, don't be double-minded about anything. Get single-focused. How do you do that? But by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. But don't stop there. Turn to God first. Now you've got a responsibility. Think upon that which is true and lovely and right. And don't stop there. Read the next verse. Do the right thing. Do the noble thing. You live it out. If you just think about it, it won't do it for you. You have to put into action the words that you believe. Faith always requires an action and a response to it. But we're looking at fear, primarily, because fear is the dominant issue, I believe. And uh, now fear is different because fear is actually identified by its object. We identify fear by its object. We have a whole categorization of fears, claustrophobia, agoraphobia, etc. Arachnophobia is a fear of, yeah, you saw the movie. And uh, uh, now, in order for a fear object to be legitimate, it has to have two attributes. It has to be, in my own mind, somehow potent, somehow present. Now, fear, again, is a God-given thing. Anytime your physical or psychological safety is threatened, fear is what you're going to experience. That's good. That's natural. Even animals have it, or they'd all be roadkill. And uh, so <clears throat> what's interesting about it is, in order for it to really be legitimate, it has to have both attributes. All you got to do is take one of the attributes away, and it's no longer potent. For instance, I moved from Arizona to here, and my home I had in Arizona, I counted seven rattlesnakes on my property over the time we lived there. One in my garage freaked my wife out. And uh, it did me until I found out what it was. Anyway, it was, uh, but right now, I actually have no fear of rattlesnakes. You know why? There's none here. And uh, now, if you threw one of those babies in and it landed right here, man, it would be exit stage right, folks, just like that. I mean, I would probably do a little damage getting it out of the way because uh, it's both eminent and it's both potent. Now, what if you threw one in, it landed right here, present, but dead? Provided I was sure it was dead. <laughs> I probably wouldn't go to a zero. I'd probably go to a two. You know, I'd kick it every now and then something. But, but here's my point. All you got to do. Now, let me, let me put a little more insight into that if I can. Let's say you got a two-year-old, you got a fenced-in backyard, and a nice mother watching her child, and the two-year-old sees a garter snake going along, and he reaches over to him, it's just like a big worm, and he picks up the garter snake. What would the mother do? Freak out, <laughs> probably. But the garter snake is really harmless. What would a zoologist do? Would he have trouble picking up that snake? No. What I'm saying is there's a learned aspect to this, and there is for everything. People are afraid of heights. I said, if you've fallen off a ladder a few times, you're going to learn to kind of respect heights. If you burn your fingers, you're going to learn to have a caution with stoves. The problem is, a lot of that learning is not based on truth. And then you end up with a phobia. Now, that'll come into play when we get to it just a little bit later on. But, um, so let me just look at three major fear objects. I mean, these are the big ones. In fact, to be honest with you, Almost all of the others are subordinate to these three, maybe four. I kind of added that on. I'll get there in a, in a little bit. But, uh, but first of all, really, death is the other one. And that's, I'm talking about physical death now. I mean, your physical life is really nothing compared to your spiritual life. We have to get that value in our own thinking to understand the truth of, of God's gospel, folks. Paul says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Precious in the sight of God is the death of one of his godly ones. How do you make sense out of that while they're with him? I said, but what attribute has he taken away? It's appointed unto every man that one day you shall die. That could happen to you tomorrow. Where, O oh death, is your sting? Where's your victory? 
What's the worst thing that could happen to you? I could die. Well, beloved, you'd be absent from the body, present with the Lord, in a resurrected body, singing hallelujah. And uh, now, listen to me. That is not a license to commit suicide. Because we're supposed to be a good steward of the life that God has entrusted to us. My point is, the person who's free from the fear of death is free to live today. That's my point. And that's the point I think God wants us to have, is that I don't have to face our fear tomorrow for the simple reason God's going to supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. But not only that, even if I should die tomorrow, I know where I'm going to go. I know where I'm going to be. I've written these unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. It's something that God wants us to know. I'm not making fun of this because, you know, people, listen, I just lost my wife of 52 years. And a loss is a loss. And losses oftentimes are the key thing that triggers off depression in people's life. But, you know, I've written on that as well. And I, I thank God for the truth that God has given to us because I'm neither alone nor depressed over this whole issue because I know where my wife is. And I look back and I said, thank God for the 52 years we had together. And I thank God I had to use almost all my retirement to take care of her. But truth of the matter is I'm glad I had the money to do it. And I don't regret any of that for a second, folks. And... Uh, and, but there was no fear there. There shouldn't be for any of us if we understood it. And for what it's worth, be a responsible parent and don't leave those decisions for your kids. Work out your will. Take care of that kind of stuff. When I go on a trip, I got on my pool table in my office right there where my will is, where my money is, where my retirement is. That's all taken care of for my kids. I've already made arrangements at the funeral home for myself. That's not morbid, folks. That's just being responsible. And we're all out to do that. Nothing's more tragic than to have a sudden death and leave all that decision-making for bereaved family members. That's just not good. I had picked out our plot and our burial spot, and uh, I got one of those things, one's on top of the other, because I'm going to win in the end. And um, <laughs> So there should be no fear of death, not if we understood this properly. Most Christians are living out there that the ultimate value is your physical life. And we hang on to things that are, don't make sense. And I said, let it go. Put your hands in, in the life of God. What you have is eternal. The primordial fear is gone. And uh, now, you know, I'm not looking forward to dying. That's a little different thing, you know, the truth of the matter is. But death, I'll tell you what, I'm at a point in my life where I'm just really looking forward to what is heaven going to be like? You want an interesting thing? What's the first verse in the Bible? God created, say the word again. Is it plural or singular? Plural. Isn't that odd? Do you ever think about that? Paul was caught up into the third heaven. What is that? I don't know, but I'm looking forward to finding out. See, that's the point. <laughs> it's a... Uh, Secondly, don't fear man. That's the other big issue. Whether it's your husband, your spouse, your kids even, your boss at work, you know, dictators, um, politics. Wow. Uh, but Jesus said, don't fear those who kill the body. Isn't that an interesting statement? Just stop right there. Don't fear them who can kill the body. Why? Because death has no power over me. The last victory that Jesus conquered was death. And he said, but fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Isolation, loneliness, separation from God. And uh, now think about that for a moment. Paul says, if you call me a people pleaser, I'm not a bond servant of Christ. If you're a people pleaser, who are you a bond servant of? Man. What power does that person have only over you? Only what you give. Suppose you got a kind of an obnoxious boss and terrorizes you at work and you're afraid of the man. And, and, uh, but you're not right now, are you? Why not? He's not here. But you go to work Monday morning, there he is, you know, and you're terrorized. And, uh, and then every morning at about 10, 10.30, something like that, you go into the lunchroom and, and there's a little sanctuary. He's not in there. So you talk about him. You know what I did today? And your friend's sitting across the table and going, ah! 
and suddenly he's present. What power does he have over you? Well, he could fire me. How would you solve that? Quit. No, don't do that. <laughs> but be willing to. I mean, if he wants you to lie for him, will you? Or will you say, sir, I'm going to be the best employee I can be for you. I respect you. I come under your authority, but I cannot lie for you. He said, well, I'll get somebody who will then. That would be your choice. But if he fires you for that, trust God he's got something better than, for you than that, folks. And that just goes across the board in our marriages, in our families, and whatever else. Don't fear their intimidation, but sanctify Christ as Lord of your life. We're going to see how that's going to be an answer in a few minutes here. But, but uh, letting people control your life like that is no way to live. And you know what's happening. It's happening in marriages and families and countries, even churches, you know, that people are being intimidated by other people in such a way and uh, using fear to control other people. Uh, that's horrible. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Third point, Satan. You go to any church in our country right now, and I'll guarantee you something, folks. More people in your church right now fear Satan more than they do God. Most of them have very little fear of God. Why is the fear of God the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of knowledge? How is it the one fear that can expel all other fears? The moment that you elevate him as a greater fear object than God, you elevate him as a greater object of worship. Isn't that sobering? But it's also true. There's not a verse in your Bible to fear Satan. That's the third point of the gospel. He's disarmed. That's why he came, to destroy the works of Satan. And you can see that wrapped up in Colossians chapter 2, verses 3, 13 through 15. He gave us a certificate that we are forgiven and gave us new life in Christ, and then he disarmed Satan. You've got to have that third of the gospel in your mind. In preparing the twelve in Luke chapter 9, the first thing he did in the discipling process was to give them authority and power over demons. When the 70 were sent out, the first thing they said when they came back, Lord, even the demons are subject to us. When Jesus revealed the things in people's hearts, do you know what the Pharisees said at that time? He has a demon. They understood at that time, if people had that kind of esoteric knowledge about other people, that they were getting their information like fake shamans and psychics and those kind of people. That's where they're getting their information from. We're told in 1 Timothy 4, 1, the Holy Spirit explicitly says, think of that language. It's not used anywhere else in the New Testament. In latter days, people will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceiving spirits. It's happening all over the world right now. I can't tell you how many hundreds of people I've sat with, taking them through our steps to freedom, Submit to God, resist the devil, and walk out with the peace of God guarding their heart and their mind. I can't tell you one today that's hearing blasphemous, condemning thoughts that it hasn't been demonic. Every one has been for me. Every one. And the best way to answer that question is, did you want to think that thought? Did you make a conscious choice to think that thought? Then why do you think it's yours? Well, I got a chemical imbalance. How can a chemical produce a personality and a thought? How could your neurotransmitters randomly fire and create a thought that you're opposed to thinking? You have a natural explanation for that? There isn't one. What you hear, I gave antipsychotic medications and the voices stopped. Well, of course, so did everything else. <laughs> <laughs> All you did was narcotize it, take the medicine away in his back. You haven't fixed a thing. You hear me on this? This is not just me talking. Everybody out there is dealing with people who are hearing voices, but it's just... The secular world has just passed this off as somehow some natural phenomena. It is not, people. It is not. Oh, I could tell you stories from here to midnight, but I'm running out of time, so I've got to go on. It's, um, you know, let me be honest with you. This is the eternal battle. This is not a game. When you read your Bible today, it's all about the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God between the truth and the lies, the father of lies and the spirit of truth and the Christ and the Antichrist. It's all a battle in the garden. And when you go to Revelation, what's end times like? It's all back to the Christ and Antichrist again, isn't it? And we're in that battle whether we like it or not. 
When I went public with my ministry starting in 1994, from 94, from 1990 to 94, four years, every night before I started a conference, three o'clock in the morning, I was alertly awakened, sometimes frightened. And uh, three o'clock in the morning, every night, Friday, before the conference started. And, uh, and it's happened to most of you. You could feel a pressure in your chest, something grabbing your throat, tried to say something, couldn't say it. If you want to see a basis for that, read Job chapter 4 tonight. Same thing happened to him, just describing it just like that. That is a spiritual attack. How do you solve that? I tried to call up in the name of the Lord, but I just felt paralyzed. I said, you can always talk to God inwardly because he knows the thoughts and intentions of your heart. So as soon as you acknowledge God and turn to him, submit to God, you can resist the devil. All you'd have to say is Jesus and stop just like that. Just like that. Every church I've done a conference in, I've asked how many have had that experience. A third of the people raise their hand every time. And the more high profile the ministry, numbers go way up. When I did this to all the leadership at Swindoll's church when he was in Fullerton, 250 leaders, almost every hand raised. We're under attack. Why does that surprise us? We've been clearly warned that would happen. But we have all the protection we need in Christ. I like the story of a father driving along his little Volkswagen with his wife, two kids in the back seat, and a bee comes in the back window. And the kids throw him, no, there's a bee here. And dad reaches back and grabs the bee and in his hand and the stinger goes into his hand. And then he releases the bee. Dad, the bee's loose. Kids, look at my hand. Christian, Jesus is saying, look at my hand. Look at my side. Look at my feet. I took the sting, folks. He died on the cross for that. And you got some kind of visitation in your room at night. Don't you want to know that you have the authority to deal with that? This is not some obscure doctrine. It's all Ephesians 1 and 2. It's all the value of being seated with Christ in the heavenlies. We're in a spiritual battle. If you can't see it, I don't know what else I could show you. How about the first page of your paper next Sunday? And the church, folks, limps along as though we have no authority to deal with these kind of issues. I've been asked by groups of pastors in Southern California I'm going to speak to next week. I said, I said, what do you want me to talk about? They said, evil. Really? In our culture? I mean, it's interesting because there's all kinds of evil things going on, but I said, there is no evil without personhood. Evil didn't cause that. Evil is a result. How many times have you said the Lord's Prayer and said, deliver us from evil? You know what every foreign translation says? Deliver us from the evil one. There's a definite article before the word evil. And all your early church writers, if you look at any one of their commentaries, all said that. And somehow we've taken that out of our vocabulary. I don't understand it, folks. But he is the evil one. And, and we're in that battle, and fear is going to be part of that battle, whether you like it or not. And our, our goal is to help people truly repent, submit to God, and resist the devil, and walk off free. And, and that's our goal. And you can do that, folks, without ever losing control. Ever losing control. You can just deal with the person. It's a repentance process. 2 Timothy 2.24, and we'll do the best we can to help you if we can. Fear of God is the interesting one. Why do we fear God? It's, uh, let me point out an interesting thing about fearing God. Excuse me, just for a second. In Isaiah chapter 8, it says, Thus the Lord spoke to me with mighty power and instructed me not to walk in the ways of this people, saying, You are not to fear what they fear, or to be in dread of it. It is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy. He shall be your fear. He shall be your dread. Then he becomes a sanctuary. Isaiah 8. Why? What two attributes does God have? He's omnipotent, and he's omnipresent. That's what makes him the ultimate fear object. He's the ultimate throne of the authority of the universe. I, uh, Psalm 34 says, The sought the Lord and he answered me, delivered me from all of my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. 
This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Uh, one of the questions that comes up, and it's a legitimate question, by the way, uh, of can you worship God and fear him at the same time? Well, perfect love is cast off fear because fear involves punishment. And uh, that punishment that we deserved has already fallen on Christ. I remember years ago as a kid on the farm and, and uh, <clears throat> went to country school for six years and went into town school, caught the bus. We had a program called Religious Day Instruction. Um, every Tuesday afternoon, the classes were shortened down. You could go to the church of your choice. And you didn't have to. You could go to study hall. So it wasn't forced. But I went to the church of my mother's choice. And, um, and uh, one nice fall day, I thought, I'm going to skip it. So I skipped it. And I thought I got away with it. I caught the bus and went home. And, and uh, next day, the principal called me in. And he read me up, left and down and right. And, I mean, this guy looked like Hitler even. I mean, he was really a tough guy. And, uh, and he said, I've arranged for you to be off Thursday and Friday. Are you kidding me? Expelled from school for two days for skipping religious day instruction? I was not looking forward to going home. I was concocting little plans. Pretend like you're sick for two days. <laughs> Didn't think I could get away with it. My sister would rat on me. So pretend I went to school and hide in the woods. No, I couldn't do that. So I knew I had to face my medicine. And I knew who to go to. That would be my mother because there would be some mercy there. And so my mom, I said... I got kicked out of school for two days for skipping religious day instruction. What? And a smile came in her face. Oh, Neil, I forgot to tell you. I called the school the other day and asked if you could be off Thursday and Friday to help us pick corn. <laughs> now, if you've done something wrong, you don't want to face the authority figure, right? And that's how most Christians are. They walk around on grass, glass, waiting for the, you know, the hammer to fall upon us. You know. And I said, Christians, the hammer fell. It fell on Christ. You're not a sinner in the hands of an angry God. You're a saint in the hands of a loving God who called you to come before his presence with confidence, with boldness, with your heart sprinkled clean. If I knew about that, would I have dreaded going home? Are you kidding me? I'd have ran up that lane. Hi, Mom and Dad, how you doing? But I didn't know that. And so I was afraid to face them. But I'll tell you what, when you see God, you're going to look in the face of pure love, folks. Pure love. Pure righteousness. Pure light. I'm looking forward to it. I'll be honest with you. In my age, you've got to have something to look forward to. And, um, but listen to this just for a second. Perfect love is fast cast off fear because fear involves punishment. That punishment has already fallen on Christ. And yet the fear of the Lord is, is the beginning of wisdom. And, and there is a beam of seat judgment. I'm going to have to stand before God someday and give an account for every deed done in the flesh, whether good or bad. And, um, and that's not for, for punishment going to hell. That essentially is for rewards, as I understand it. I said, but that accountability really does th you know, have an effect on me because fear is a powerful motivation. And there's nothing bigger in my life to motivate me more than I want to stand before God someday and have him say, oh, limp in, you jerk. I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant, don't you? I want to have a legacy behind me. I want to be able to say thank you for being faithful all these years to the truth and the trust that I gave to you. But listen to me. Loving God and fearing God are not mutually exclusive. Do you love someone who's always truthful? You love that person? Do you love someone who is big enough to protect you from your enemies? Do you love someone who has the means and desire to supply all your needs? Do you love someone who forgives you when you sin, accepts you for who you are, loves you unconditionally? Do you love someone who will ensure that justice is done in the end? Do you love someone who volunteers to serve your sentence when you're found guilty? Do you love someone who cares enough to discipline you so that you don't miss out on your rewards? Do you love someone who sets you free and enables you to become all that you were created to be? Suppose that someone is so holy and majestic that to be full in his presence would require a resurrected body and all those who are privileged to see him can't stop singing his praises. 
For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the loving kindness towards those who fear him. Just as the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Do you love God? With all my heart. Because I love truth. I love justice. I love gentleness. I love meekness. I love everything about him. He's my father. He's my God. He took my place. Afraid of him? No, but I'm highly motivated to want to please him. Paul says, make it your ambition to live your life to please God. Don't play for the grandstand. Play for the coach, folks. Change your life. I come across something some time ago that kind of surprised me. And uh, How many people struggle with a fear of failure? Uh, that uh, I had to dig into that a little bit because I, I, I have to confess, it hasn't really been a, a major struggle for me in my life, but I remember doing a doctor ministry class at, at Denver Seminary and have a, everybody fill out a little form beforehand. I'm taking this class because... And one of the sentence completions was, the thing I fear the most is 17 out of 17. They said it in different ways, but 17 out of 17 of the pastors essentially said, fear of failure. And I looked at that and I said, how come nobody said fear of God? And the motorboat came on. But, 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 but. I said, well, I'll think about that for a moment, folks, because if you're motivated not to fail, that's not the same motivation to succeed. That's like sticking your car in reverse and slamming on the brake. You're not going to get very far that way. Everybody lumps, likes the security of the trunk, but truth of the matter is all the fruit is out on the edge of the limb. Somewhere along the line, faith is a risk. It's a risk that we all take. It's a risk we should be willing to take to be a faithful person and a steward of God. I've read a couple autobiographies I did years ago about Teddy Roosevelt. What an interesting character that guy was. I mean, he was kind of a pot-bellied guy, had poor eyesight, but he just did some of the most incredible, daring stuff. He left this little legacy. It's not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by the dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause, who, at the best, knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who, at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that he Place shall never be with those who are cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. One guy wrote, said, to laugh is to risk appearing a fool. To weep is to risk appearing sentimental. To reach out for another is to risk involvement. To expose feelings is to risk exposing your true self. To place your ideas and dreams before a crowd is to risk their loss. To love is to risk not being loved in return. To live is to risk dying. To hope is to risk despair. To try is to risk failure. But risks must be taken because the greatest hazard in life is to risk nothing. The person who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing, is nothing. He may avoid suffering and sorrow, but he cannot learn, feel, change, grow, or live. Chained by his certitude, he is a slave who has forfeited all freedom. Only a person who risks is free. How would you define failure? To stumble and fall is not failure. To stumble and fall again is not failure. Failure comes when you say you're pushed and fail to get up again. To make a mistake is not failure unless you fail to learn from it. My life verses in Proverbs 24, 16, the righteous fall seven times, but they get up again. <laughs> the difference between the winner and the loser is the winner got up one more time than the loser did. And uh, this famous executive was retiring, and he had quite a legacy left behind him, and this young executive was going to take his place and said, Sir, how do you account for your great success? He said, No mistakes. Whoa. How do you get to the point where you make no mistakes? A lot of experience. 
What kind of experience? A lot of mistakes. <laughs> true, isn't it? It's true. It's true. We're a success. You know, when Joshua was going to the promised land, he said, if you only keep the word of my mouth and keep in meditating, you will have success wherever you go, and then you will prosper. I said, how would I understand success? Because you can be a complete failure in the, in the eyes of the world and complete success in the eyes of God. The world could look at Jesus and call him a failure if they didn't understand what he did. You know, well, nice job, but you died on the cross. But I have finished the work he called me to do. And... Um, uh, but you can be a complete success in this world, a complete failure in the eyes of God. I, I think it's descending order in this way. I think success really begins, if you really want to be successful, in God's eyes, I said, then know God in his ways. I count everything but rubbish apart from the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Uh, if you know God in his ways, it's the only thing you can boast in. Jeremiah in 1 Corinthians 1 said, Let him who boast, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. The second is, is to become the person God created you to be. That is God's will for your life. There is nobody on this planet, there is nothing, thing, nothing that can keep you from being the person God created you to be but yourself. Deeply believe that. This is God's will for your life, your sanctification. It's being before doing, maturity before ministry, character before career. Focus on becoming the person God has created you to be, and then things start to open up. And thirdly, be a good steward of the time, talent, and treasures that God has trusted to you. I heard the last end of Pompeo's speech this morning, and that was alluding to the talents that his God has given to us. And just take what God has given to you and be a good steward of that. Take what time God has given you, what treasure he's given to you, and use it to the glory of God. You do that, folks, you'll be successful. And there's nobody out there that can keep that from happening but ourselves. And uh, how am I time doing here? Terrible. Anyway, uh, let's, let's take a look at this thing because phobias are irrational. I mean, the word is given to us right there. It's an irrational fear. If that's the case, then somewhere along the line, I'm believing a lie. Are you with me? That's really true. See, the problem it is, is how do we get at that? You will not solve the phobia, essentially, if you don't deal with the lie. You can't deal with the effect. It's the cause behind it. There's something I'm believing that's not true. That's why it's truth that sets us free. Uh, I remember I was up in another country. I'll just say this. I don't want to identify the person. But I started at a conference, and this really attractive 40-year-old lady comes up, uh, it turned out she had five businesses. Uh, she said, can I have a, some personal time with you? And the Spirit of God said, not alone. <laughs> and um, so the pastor was there, and I said, you got some time Monday morning? He said, I do. I said, uh, would you uh, meet with me? And so the three of us met. And uh, here's a gal who, who grew up in a very, uh, very prominent Christian home, actually, very conservative. She's got five businesses. She's asked to speak a number of times. She's a pillar of the community, actually. But she has to sit in the back row of the church because she's agoraphobic. They ask her to come places she can't fly. She sits in the back row in case she has a panic attack, so she would leave. And uh, now, who am I, folks? How do I know the basis for that? Where did that start from? But I can promise you something, folks. In everything, there's always a cause and an effect. Always. The problem is the cause may not be external. The cause may start with a lie that you are believing right here. And that's why it's very difficult for the secular world to ever uncover those kind of things because they're not even asking about it. And, uh, but as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And uh, so all I got to do to trip up your life is just get you to believe a few lies. And if you believe a pack of lies, you're on the wrong path somewhere. Can't help but do it. There isn't anything that you don't do without first thinking it. So here's the control center. And uh, so I didn't know what it was. Basically, she's left us the impression that she's a virgin. And I'm just hearing her story. I don't judge people. So I said, would you like to resolve this? I always ask that, by the way. 
Nobody has ever to this day said no. I said, with your permission, I'd like to lead you through these steps to freedom. Okay. I need one cooperation from you. If you have something in your mind right now that's opposing to what we're saying or we're talking about, just share it with me. All i got to do is get it out in the light. Just expose it to the light, and it'll just stop. And, uh, and you'll never lose control with that person if they're willing to do that. And so we went through it. I mean, she's lived a very responsible life. She's, she's a neat lady, and we're going through real good. There's a place in there where they pray and ask the Lord to reveal to their mind every sexual use of their body as an instrument of unrighteousness. Romans chapter 6 says if you do that, you're going to allow sin to reign in your mortal body. So she got to that point. She prayed the prayer, and she said, well, it's not like 200 or something. I said, well, honey, we're here to help you. We're not here to condemn you. Out came six affairs. Now, Franks, I would be willing to bet you my next year's salary, because I don't have one, <laughs> that she came to that session, I'll share anything with these two men, but I won't share that. I, I would bet you that's how she came. Now, that didn't come from me, and she wasn't sharing it just to share it. She was sharing it to resolve it. And out came six affairs. I renounced having sex with so-and-so. I asked God to break that bond because if you join yourself to harlot, you become one flesh. And then she gave her body to God as a living sacrifice. Why are we urged by God to do that for that reason? You do that first, Romans 12, 2. Then you can do the next verse, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But if you're trying to win this sexual struggle that you're in without breaking the bondage first, trying to renew your mind is almost impossible, if not impossible. Well, folks, she made it through. Guess what happened to her agoraphobia? I didn't know that. God knew it. I didn't have a clue. Surprised me. I'm always surprised, to be honest with you. And uh, so what we do, and it's in our steps, it's an appendix kind of a thing, but I said, because frankly, going through our steps to freedom seems to resolve almost all of them, but there's always that learned aspect of it. And so we asked them to pray, and the prayer is in your worksheet there, and uh, ask God to give that guidance. Open our eyes. What is it that I'm believing? What's the lie that I'm kind of believing? Then take a moment to just analyze your own personal life. Fear is a powerful motivator. It's either preventing you from doing what is right or responsible or compelled you to do something that is wrong or irresponsible or prevented you to compromise your witness. I mean, look at the fear of witnessing today. Why has that always come up? I mean, I'm supposed to share the gospel and be a good witness, and here I freeze up in fear. If you don't help people get over the fear, nobody's going to do it. I found that out years ago. That's why on-the-job training is so effective. But, but anyway, take a good look at it. Do you want to keep living that way? I mean, you're letting this person terrorize you. What is it? What power do they have over you? What are you giving to them? And um, so analyze your your lifestyle, what's going on in my life that's keeping me really from living a responsible life or compelling me to live an irresponsible life? That I'm going to keep satisfying this boyfriend because he keeps beating me up if I don't keep doing what he wants me to do. I mean, that's a legitimate fear. I understand that. But let's start there, you know, so we can reach to a solution that gets rid of that fear in your life. Then prayerfully work out a plan of responsible behavior. This may take some good counseling by a good friend, a good discipler in your life to, to work out something that says, what can I do now that I know is responsible? And how can I do that? And then uh, determine in advance what your response is going to be, depending upon it. So don't walk in, into that blind. I'll give you an illustration in a second. Finally, commit yourself to do it. The cue to any cure is commitment. I like the story of the Coast Guard where a storm raged up and they were called out to sea and rescue and this young seaman come up to the captain Sir, we can't go out. We'll never come back. The captain said, we must go out. We don't have to come back. And, and that became kind of a standard of the Coast Guard, which is true. This is our responsibility. We're going out. And um, so I remember this young girl came to me in a college group one time. She said, I haven't spoken to my dad in two years. I said, you want to keep living like that? She's afraid of him. And we just haven't talked. We live in the same house. We haven't talked in two years. I said, you want to keep doing that? No, but what can I do? I said, so we worked out a plan. Here's the plan. Dad comes home tonight. I said, just say hi, Dad. That's all I asked her to do. It wasn't a big assignment. 
Just say, hi, Dad. And then we worked out what could be response. Well, he could get mad. He could say nothing. He could respond to you. I said, what, how would you respond to those three possibilities? And then I asked for a commitment. I said, call me after you do it. Will you do it? I'll do it. Seven o'clock that night, phone rang. I said, he said hi. <laughs> <laughs> I asked her to share that the next Sunday in the Sunday school class, and another girl came forward. Her mom had gone through divorce and married a man who wasn't a Christian. He moved into the home, and she just resented him and hated him, and they haven't spoken in two years. That man wouldn't even let her eat dinner with him. She had to eat dinner in a bedroom by herself. And I said, have you ever loved and respected that man? Well, she hated him, to be honest with you. Never accepted him, you know, and had this tension. And I said, you're the Christian. She's not, he's not the Christian. I said, why don't you try something? When he comes home tonight, ask his permission to talk to you. Think you could do that? What would I say? Well, let's think what you could say. You could say, I want to ask your forgiveness because I've never accepted you into our home and I haven't loved you. So we talked about that a little bit. And she was reticent at first, but finally she made a commitment. I said, call me. And I found out. She actually did it. He came home and he met her at the door. He said, may I please talk to you? He said, okay. He said, I want to ask your forgiveness because I've never loved you and never accepted you in our home. He goes, my God, I've got a daughter. Isn't that amazing? How much of that stuff goes on? Just controlled by fear. And suddenly you kind of step out and work out a plan. If you're afraid to fly an elevator, go, don't go to the Empire State Building and push 99 or whatever. <laughs> I said, it, it has to be somewhat reasonable. Go to a two-story building. Open the door, walk in and walk out. Then let the door close. And then take the next step. But you'll never get over it if you don't do it. If you can't cross that bridge, you'll never get over it until you cross the bridge. It won't happen. My wife was afraid of flying, and she took a fear of flying class. And they asked the people there, how many think by the fear and your anxiety is helping to keep the plane in the air? <laughs> That's rather irrational, isn't it? Well, unfortunately, to pass the class, you had to get in the plane. And I'll be honest with you, Denver's not the best place to do that. <laughs> right in the base of the Rocky Mountains. It's a rough ride every time. But she did it. Bless her heart. She got over it. Uh, she would say after that, the only time I'll fly is if you're in the plane because you're God's man and the plane won't go down if you're in it. Now that was irrational too, but... <laughs> Folks, this is a mega problem. It is, people are paralyzed by fear all over the world. And what I've discovered is, is that if you want an explanation, the book will give it to you. If you want transformation, and we've included it in the book, go through the steps. We need an encounter with God. That's the fear of God. You need to connect with him. God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. I don't have to let fear control my life. Fear will always be here. But you go on in spite of it. Freedom is not the absence of fear. Freedom is overcoming the fear with trust. And the trust has to be in God. Can we do it, people? God bless you. Let me pray for you before you go. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your presence, for your goodness, for your justice, your mercy, your grace. Everything we have, everything we are, we all owe it to you, Father. I just pray for these people. They're caregivers. They care. That's why they're here. God, give them wisdom. Let them be tools in your hand to set cats as free and heal the wounds of the brokenhearted. And I pray for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your prayerful support of Freedom in Christ Ministries. All of our content is made possible by you. Your generous support and financial gifts make these videos and our ministry possible. For more information on how to support our ministry, please visit www.freedominchrist.org and click Get Involved.